I'm just trying to do good. Have fun. And we're going to have a good time. Okay, good. It is still afternoon ish. Good afternoon, sisters. I need you to make a little more noise than that. Yes, that's what I need for the next 30 minutes. Okay. So um, today we're going to talk about counting the costs. All right. So I know you're thinking that I'm going to teach you or talk through counting the costs of those that we're, you know, making into disciples. But I'm actually talking about how to count the cost with yourself. Ooh. You know, um, I want to do a little survey really quick. Raise your hand if you've been a disciple for um, a year. All right, raise your hand if you've been a disciple for more than five years. Ten years. Twenty years. Twenty-five. Come on, Thirty. Come on, Jill. Come on, Jill. All right, so what's really interesting is that when you counted the cost, when Jill counted the cost 30 years ago, she was a completely different woman. And over those 30 years, God has added to her. And I would imagine to stay faithful for 30 years, you've had to continue to count the cost over and over again. And it's the same for us. Um, what's really awesome is that in the Boston church, we exploded a ton in the past two years, um, but we did explode during the COVID season. And so uh, recently, Mike decided that he wanted to do something to re-solidify the, um, the base of our church. Right? He wanted to get a sold out base. And so he said, we're going to count the cost of every member. Wow. Every member. He gave us this really awesome sheet. I was like, amen, bro. Let's do it. Um, but it's really cool because when we counted the cost of every member in our regions, we got to really see what was in the hearts of our disciples. Yeah. You know, and um, I'm really excited today because I'm going to just talk a lot about my life. I'm going to talk a lot about my personal experiences um, and, and really what happens when we don't continue to count the cost in our discipleship is that we become lukewarm, mm -hmm. right? When we stop counting the cost, we stop giving up everything. Wow. Um, and I have this really cool illustration. Um, so do you want to know a really cool way to kill a frog? No. 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 I know. It's not really fun. But um, yep. what I found is that there's a story that someone told me a while ago. You put a frog in room temperature water. Oh, yeah. yep. And then you turn the heat up. And then as you turn the heat up, the frog doesn't jump out because the frog doesn't realize that the temperature is increasing the boiling temperatures. Mm -hmm. And so naturally, slowly, the frog will just die. Yeah. You know, and that's how we are. That's how fragile we are spiritually yeah. when we stop counting the cost. Yeah. When we stop realizing how much we need to give to God. Come on. Um, wow. And so uh, a bit about me. I am seven years old spiritually. I, just um, I was baptized in Chicago church. I moved to New York City a year later. Uh, and then about, well, I was in five and a half years. Um, I had a ton of dreams while I was in New York City. Uh, I had dreams of going to the AMS ministry. I had dreams of, of becoming a singer-songwriter. Um, but God had me in, in Queens for quite some time. And finally, uh, in my fifth or fourth year of being a disciple, I got sent to the AMS ministry, and that was like a dream come true. Um, God allowed me to build relationships with women that were in the industry, like professional yeah. dancers. And I mean, I was in the AMS ministry, even though it was COVID. I was just like, this is the dream. Yeah. This is my kingdom dream. Mm -hmm. I really don't have any more dreams, God. You don't need to give me anything else because this is what I wanted. What's better than the AMS ministry in New York City? Mm -hmm. um, and, and I was so grateful but my heart was very comfortable. Mm -hmm. My heart was so content and so in love with the gifts that I began to stop giving up everything for the gift giver, mm -hmm. right? And this wasn't exposed in my heart until I started dating this incredible brother. Oh, um, at the time, Jay was in Boston and I was in New York City and we had dated for about four months. And for I promise you guys, for those four months, I was praying. I was like, God, God, we're both musicians. Like, <laughs> AMS makes sense. On, you don't want me to go to Boston, God. I am a sing I'm going to be the Beyonce of the kingdom. I can't be the Beyonce of the kingdom in Boston. I have to stay in New York City. And, and so it's really funny because um, 
I, I did talk to God about it. I was like, you know, God, if you really want me to go to Boston, these specific things need to happen. And the first thing that I, I included is Brandon Speckman herself has to call me and ask. And it's so funny because I was on the bus uh, the July 3rd on my way to Boston to visit Jay and I get a call from Brandon and she's like, hey, how are you? Okay, that's awesome. So I wanted to know if you would like to um, move to our Boston church and serve in the ministry as an intern alongside your awesome boyfriend, Jay. And I was quiet. I was just like, amen. Um, so I wrestled, I wrestled. And I'm so grateful for, for Brandon's faith because ultimately it came down to what requires the most faith. Um, now, when I was struggling with moving to Boston, the biggest issue that I had was I wanted to have a comfortable discipleship. I had gotten very comfortable and I, my conversation with God was like, God, I want to be, I want to, like, I'm okay being average. Mm. I'm okay having a, a mediocre discipleship. Mm. And I didn't say that, like, clearly. I wouldn't say that, like, mm. outwardly. But yeah. I'm like, I'm like the person that's like, I don't need to be in the front. Yeah. Yeah. I can just kind of set the table. I'll set the table for you. Oh. <laughs> I, like, I'll just set the table and like go into shadows. Like, I don't need to do anything extravagant, God. Yeah. Why do you want to give me this extravagant plan? Why are you calling me something greater mm -hmm. than what I'm comfortable with? And I, it led me to Revelation 3. Mm -hmm. And I know you all know this passage, right? Um, and in Revelation 3, 16 through 18, talks about how the church of Laodicea became lukewarm. Mm -hmm. And he says, I'm going to spit you out. Yeah. And I think what's su what super interesting and he says is that you say that you're wealthy mm. you talk about all these things that you've had you've accumulated all these riches mm. but you're naked you're pitiful and you're poor and you're blind mm. and that's what happens when we become lukewarm wow. and it's really interesting because God himself the Holy Spirit had to tell me that I was lukewarm wow. because I was praying I was like God I'm just average I just I want to be average don't give me anything awesome and then he said Google synonyms for average mm. mediocre complacent mm. lukewarm Wow. wow. And God said, do you know what happens to lukewarm disciples? I was like, yes. They get spit out of their mouth. Mm -hmm. He's like, exactly. Um, and so oh, I'm just so grateful crazy. because um, that same day I went to Revelation 3 and I want to read you guys something that really convicted me. On, Revelation on, 3 okay. verses 1 and 2. Come on. Um, this really stood out to me. That was not bad. It's the church in, in Sardis. Um the same day after God told me I was lukewarm, <laughs> he's like, now read a little further up. Start in the beginning of the chapter. It mm -hmm. says to the angel of the church in Sardis, uh, right? These are the words of him who holds the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I know your deeds. You have a reputation of being alive, but you are dead. Wake wow. up, strengthen what remains and is about to die. Wow. For I have found your deeds unfinished mm -hmm. in the sight of my God. And you guys can continue to read, of course, on your own. Um, but I just read this and I began to weep yeah. because I realized, yeah. like, in my very small seven years, mm. I've gotten complacent. And I look at God, and I'm like, I got my, I like, I have my ministry that I love. I have the girls that I disciple. I have my roommates. I have my boyfriend. I'm satisfied. Mm. God, don't give me anything more. Mm. Don't call me to anything greater. And and He looks at me and He says, Tyler, your work isn't finished. Yeah. Um. And so that's why counting the cost is so important. Yeah. Because today. I really just want to encourage all of you because you guys have a gift here. There's so much maturity in this room. Yeah. yeah. There's so much wisdom in this room. Yeah. And as much as God has used you all to do in 30 years, 25 years, 15 years, he says, your work is unfinished. Mm -hmm. There's more. There's so much more to do. Yeah. Um, and so I want to go to Luke 14. We're all really um, familiar with this. Don't worry, I haven't said my first point yet, but it'll go, it'll go quick. Um, Luke chapter 14. On, this is the scripture we read in the counting the cost study. Um, and so Luke 14 verses 25 through 33. Large crowds were traveling with Jesus and turning to them. He said, if anyone comes to me and does not hate father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, even their own life. Such a person cannot be my disciple. And whoever does not carry their cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. Mm -hmm. Suppose one of you wants to build a tower. 
Won't you first sit down and estimate the cost to see if you have enough money to complete it? For if you lay the foundation and are not able to finish it, everyone who sees it will ridicule you saying, this person began to build, was wasn't able to finish. Or suppose a king is about to go to war against another king. Will he first sit down and consider whether he is about about is sorry whether he's able with 10,000 men to oppose the one coming against him with 20,000 if he is not able he will send a delegation while the other is still a long way off and will ask for terms of peace in the same way those of you who do not give up everything you have cannot be my disciples mm-hmm. and this was really moving for me particularly when we were at the Mary's retreat um, earlier in the year last year because what they taught in one of the sessions was that when you commit to discipleship, when you commit to start building this tower, to give up everything and be baptized as a sold out disciple, it's not just a commitment to start, it's a commitment to finish. Wow. Yeah. And, and so that's why we're talking about counting the cost because today you want to see, am I building a tower that's going to make it all the way to the end of my race? Right. Or have I stopped investing in my building with God? Wow. Um, and so to begin our kind of the cost with the disciples in Boston, we asked the question, hey, if you were studying the Bible with yourself, could you baptize yourself today? Mm-hmm. Wow. And that's a question that I just want to ask all of you ladies in here. Mm-hmm. If you were studying the Bible with yourself today, could you baptize yourself? Um, one of the areas that came up a lot when we were asking the disciples if you would baptize yourself could you um and a lot of the areas that they mentioned was their purpose their lifestyle and the cost of giving up everything Mm -hmm. um and so the purpose is mark one right mark chapter one verse 14 through 18 mark chapter one verses 14 through 18 okay it says after john was uh put in prison Jesus went into Galilee proclaiming the good news of God. The time has come, he said, the kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. As Jesus walked beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and his brother Andrew casting a net into the lake, for they were fishermen. Come, follow me, Jesus said, and I will send you out to fish for people. At once, at once, at once they left their nets and follow him. And it's so interesting because when we do the Bible study, when we do discipleship with the women, I'll ask them, what are nets that you need to drop? Yeah. And so sisters, what are the nets Mm -hmm. that you need to drop in your relationship with God? The things that are keeping you from living out your purpose. Mm -hmm. I love what Val shared. I love her conviction. I love hearing from Diane and just hearing her conviction. Like, I'm going to go play bingo. I'm going to create ways to evangelize because there are women who are disturbed. Just like Valerie was sharing, they're waiting for us to open our mouths. Mm -hmm. Have we stopped dropping our nets? Mm -hmm. What are the nets that we picked up that's holding us back? Mm -hmm. Another thing is is the lifestyle. Luke chapter 9. Luke chapter 9. I really appreciate combing through the discipleship Bible study um, because when I did it with myself, in a lot of ways, I saw how I had stopped living the lifestyle of a disciple. Mm. And it's hard. It's hard when, you know, you may be talented or you look good, religious, like Jay was saying. It's very hard when you're religious. Yeah. No one's going to ask you. Did you deny yourself today? Yeah. Did you carry your cross? Because only you really know right. those right. areas. Yep. But God knows. Yeah. And Luke chapter 9, uh, verses 23 to, through 27. Then he said to them all, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross. How often? Daily. Daily. And follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it. But whoever loses their life for me will save it. What good is it for someone to gain the whole world and yet lose or forfeit their very self? Whoever is ashamed of me and my words, the Son of Man will be ashamed of them when he comes in his glory and in the glory of the Father and of the holy angels. And so I began to realize that I need to deny myself daily. And the areas that I wasn't denying myself in, sharing my faith, um, I, I wasn't denying myself in so quiet times, right? Mm-hmm. Um, I will have a daily quiet time. Mm-hmm. But what I wouldn't do is I wouldn't protect the schedule. Mm-hmm. Set an alarm to get up at a certain time. 
hit snooze, mm -hmm. sleep in, settle, settling for a mediocre quiet time. Mm -hmm. Think about your quiet times when you first got baptized. Mm -hmm. When it was like you were reading the Bible for the first time. Yeah. For, some of us, for some of us, you were reading the Bible for yeah. the first time. Yeah. Yeah. And God says, I am still your first love. Yeah. I still have so much more to teach you. Yeah. Uh, but for me, I had stopped carrying that cross of just denying the pleasure mm -hmm. of just indulging in what feels good sleeping in. Mm -hmm. You know, what are the areas in your life where you stopped carrying your cross? Mm -hmm. And the last area was, of course, counting the cost, right? And we just read that in Luke chapter 14. I won't go there for the sake of time, but we all know that the cost is everything. Yeah. Yeah. It's not anything but it's everything. Yeah. And when I did the discipleship study with myself, I realized that the Bible says, he says the terms of peace are to give up everything. And I had to ask myself, Tyler, are you at peace? Mm -hmm. The answer was no. Mm -hmm. My heart was raging. Oh my goodness. My heart was raging in so many areas, anxious about everything, mm -hmm. anxious about my future. Um, Jay and I got married in May of last year, Come on. anxious oh. about trying to figure out how to be a wife. Oh my goodness. <laughs> anxious about um, leading new things, taking on the campus women in Boston. Um, I had never led to that capacity before. And I was just so anxious. There was no peace. I, I remember waking up with headaches because there was no peace. Mm -hmm. Sisters, if there's no peace, Peace, you have stopped giving up everything. Wow. And so my challenge from point number one, point number one is count the cost. So sorry, I forgot to tell you that. Come on. Point number one is count the cost. Yeah. Um, and so my challenge is in your next D time, go through the discipleship study. Mm. And for those that are disciplers, I want you to lead in vulnerability. Mm. Lead your women in vulnerability. Start off by confessing all the ways that you fall short <coughs> and then call them and inspire them to go back to their first love. Come on. All right. Point number two, pierced by the cross. Come on. Come on. Let's go okay. to, I'm going to need some help on this because I don't have my phone here. Um, but let's go to Hebrews chapter five, verses 11 through 14. Whoever has the Bible app open, can you pull up the TPT version of this? The quickest person. Hebrews chapter five. 11 through 14, the Passion Version, TPT. <laughs> no pressure, I selected one. Uh, 11 through 14. You got it? Okay, can you read it, read it loud and proud for us? Come on, <laughs> Sure, yeah. Preach it, sis. We have much to say about this topic, although it is difficult to explain, because you have become too dull and sluggish to understand. <clears throat> For you should already be professors instructing others by now, but instead you need to be taught from the beginning the basics of God's prophetic oracles. Oracles, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, you're like children still needing milk and not yet ready to digest solid food. Mm. For every spiritual infant who lives on milk is not yet pierced mm. by the revelation of righteousness. Mm. The solid food is for mature, whose, spirit, whose spiritual senses perceive heavenly matters. Mm. And they, they have been adequately trained by what they've experienced to emerge with understanding of the difference mm. between between what is truly excellent and what is evil and harmful. Awesome. Thank you, sis. Yeah. Great. So in the NIV, it says that you don't understand because you no longer try to understand. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But I love the passion because it says you've become dull and sluggish. Mm -hmm. You've become lazy to understand mm -hmm. again. And he says, although you should be a professor, you should be yeah. able to teach. You've become sluggish. Because why it says you haven't been pierced by the revelation of righteousness. Yes. And when I read that, I was like, hold up, wait, what is, wait, what does that mean? The revelation of righteousness. And I began to just ponder, what is the revelation of righteousness that I should be pierced by? Mm. And I immediately thought about Christ who was pierced for me. That's right. yeah. And so 
In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, we will go there. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Come on, Are you pierced by the revelation of righteousness? Mm. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Come on, Ty. Go with you. Okay. All right, verse 14. For Christ's love compels us because we are convinced that one died for us. All mm -hmm. and therefore all died, and he died for all that those who live should no longer live for themselves, mm -hmm. but for him who died for them and was raised again. So from now on, we regard no one from a worldly point of view, but we once regarded Christ in this way, we do so no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come, the old has gone, the new is here. All this is from God who reconciled us to himself. Through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation, that God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them. <clears throat> I think it's so special that Paul is explaining here. He says the love of Christ compels. Yeah. Valerie is pierced by the revelation of righteousness. Yeah. If you heard the way she spoke about yeah. loving the lost. Yeah. She's compelled by God's love. Yeah. And so it compels her to go speak yeah. to women. I thought about piercing, right? When you pierce your ears, you don't pierce your ears to like not take the, not put the earrings in, right? Mm -hmm. You don't scrape your ear. You pierce your ears with the, with the intent of wearing a jewel yeah, to display something, yeah. to display something that's beautiful and glorious. When our hearts are pierced by the revelation of the cross, mm -hmm. then we carry it wherever we go and mm -hmm. we display the glory. Wow. We display Come the glory on. of God. And it literally says here, it literally, it literally says that God does not count our sins against us, but rather he has forgiven us and made us new, reconciled us to himself. And then it says he committed to us the ministry of reconciliation. Mm -hmm. God rather than giving us death that we deserve, entrusted his most precious possession yeah. to us, mm -hmm. to you. Are you pierced by the revelation yep. of righteousness? Are your hearts really pierced? Yeah. I think it's really yeah. awesome to know all the things that happened in Syracuse. I was talking to uh, Jill right before we started today. And I was like, Jill, what's happening in the Syracuse mm -hmm. church with the women? Mm -hmm. And I love that she said, she said, hey, we, we've established, we have like a foundation for every ministry. We've got a campus ministry. We've got singles. You know, we've got mature singles. We've got married. And I was just like, wow, what are you guys about to really do? What are the women in this room about to really do? And I love something that Chanel always says. She says, hey, Satan has a plan and God has a plan. Yeah. God's plan is for this church to explode. Yeah. Yeah. God's plan is for you all to be pierced by the cross mm -hmm. and you go and you multiply disciples. Mm -hmm. yeah. But Satan has a plan. It's for you to be apathetic towards the cross. Mm -hmm. Satan's plan is for you to not be broken, just mm -hmm. like Dale talked about, to fear vulnerability. Mm -hmm. Satan's plan is for you to be complacent and comfortable. Mm -hmm. Satan's plan is for you to run away from the cross. Mm -hmm. And so what are you going to choose today? Mm. Are we going to choose to count the cost and be pierced by the cross? Mm. What are we going to choose? Mm. Come on. Come on. Wow. The question that I have is, how is your personal evangelism? Come on. The church has grown a lot. But I want to ask you, how is your personal evangelism? Come on. Because... Your personal evangelism is directly connected to your relationship with the cross. Wow, your on. fellowship with the cross. I don't remember who said it. Someone said it today. But if we're not sharing our faith and we're not cut, we're not broken, we are religious. Yeah. We are not ambassadors. Yeah. We've got to bring our hearts back to the cross yeah. um and so something that i thought about is you know we do a lot of work to prepare for baptism yeah yes what's something that you had to do someone just call it out something you had to do to prepare for baptism forgive 
forgive, right? Yeah. Sometimes we have to write letters oh, yeah. to forgive. Some of us have to write a lot of letters. Oh, yeah. you know, some of us have to make some phone calls. Uh-huh. What's something else that you had to do to get ready for baptism? Give up relationships. Give up relationships. Mm-hmm. Sacrifice them, mm-hmm. right? Um, I, I, for me, I had to give up people pleasing, mm-hmm. you know, we had to do work. There was like blood, sweat and tears going to that baptism. Yeah. Yeah. And then when you went into the water, you were fired up because you went into the waters pledging a clear conscience to God. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And so we do all this work to prepare for discipleship, but we forget that that same amount of work is necessary for maintaining discipleship. Yeah. 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 So we have to put in the same amount of work. I really appreciate um, Revelations 2, 4 to 5. Revelations chapter 2. Chapter Hold five. on, Tyler. Let's go I want to be mindful of time here. So I'll read it quickly. Revelations chapter 2, verses 4 to 5. So at the, at the beginning of this, you know, um, he's encouraging the church of Ephesus and all the great things they're doing, but there's a challenge that comes in verse four. It says, yet I hold this against you. You have forsaken the love you had at first. Mm-hmm. Consider how far you have fallen. Repent and do the things you did at first. In mm-hmm. the King James Version, it says, do the first works. Do your first works. And so like I told you, I'm going to tell you guys a lot about my life. Um, When I did the discipleship study with myself, I just wept. And I realized that I needed to do everything possible to get my heart back close to the cross Mm. again. Um, And so how I did that is I I wrote a sin list. Yeah. That sin list. I had like a receipt paper. I was like right on the back of a receipt, flipped it over. I was asking sisters for paper. I didn't have my journal, but I was just eager to clear my heart before God. Mm-hmm. I was eager to get to the foot of the cross again. Mm-hmm. And so my challenge from this point about being pierced to the cross by the cross is to write a sin list. Mm-hmm. Write a sin <laughs> list. Yeah, when Dale said that, I was like, amen. God wants them to get open. That is awesome. We're going to have some awesome deep rooms in the Syracuse church. Um, so, but, but specifically, this is how I want you guys to do it. And if you're okay with this, Jill, I think it'll be awesome in your Bible talks. Get with your Bible talks. Everyone write a sin list and then have the passion ready. You can have some popcorn, get some pillows, some Kleenex. You know how we do it as sisters and confess, get it out. The, the, the small things, the big things, the things that you're uh, embarrassed to share, yeah. get it all out because God wants to use you. Yeah. God is not finished with you or the Syracuse church. This is yeah. just the beginning. Yeah. This is just the beginning. Um, and so my last point here is carry your cross, Ooh, right? Nice. So the first point was count the cost right? Mm -hmm. Our second point is you have to be pierced by the cross. And so once you've counted the cost and you're pierced by the cross, now you can carry a cross. We want to carry a cross. Matthew chapter 26, verses 36 through 39. I really appreciate the example of Jesus. He doesn't ask us to do anything that he didn't do first. That's right. Amen. I really appreciate that. And I love what Alyssa shared when she was just talking about her emotions. Um, I don't know about you sisters, but I'm very emotional. I feel everything. And then it feels like truth. My emotions become reality. Like you can't tell me what I feel is not true. Like, I feel it. And it must be true. But what I really love is that Jesus felt a lot as well in the Garden of Gethsemane. Yeah. Um, when I get there, I can read what he felt. <laughs> All right, Matthew 26. You guys still with me? Yes. Yes. Amen. All right, in verse 36, then Jesus went with his disciples to a place called Gethsemane, and he said to them, sit here while I go over there and pray. He took Peter and the two sons of Zebedee along with him, and he began to be sorrowful and troubled. Then he said to them, my soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. Stay here and keep watch with me. Going a little farther, he fell with his face to the ground and prayed, My father, if it is possible, may this cup be taken from me, yet not as I will, but as you will. These are real emotions. This is not like hypothetical. Mm -hmm. Jesus is fully God and fully man. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. And he was overwhelmed with sorrow. Maybe in the last year, you've had moments of feeling overwhelmed with sorrow, mm-hmm. disappointment, anger, feeling misunderstood, whatever it may be, Christ can relate to you in this moment. But what I love about this moment is that he didn't go and stuff his emotions. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Talk about that. He didn't bury them. Yeah. Mm-hmm. He didn't even try to sugarcoat them when he told God how he really yeah. felt. He yeah. just said, I'm overwhelmed to the point of death. Mm-hmm. Have any of you felt overwhelmed to the point of death? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Some of us have. Yeah. And keep it real. There have been times where God has called me to give up things. And it felt like literally I felt him tearing my heart open. Yeah. And I was just like, God, why do you keep doing this to me? Why do you keep hurting me? Mm-hmm. Um, a bit about my situation. Ooh, I'm getting emotional. Mm-hmm. Yeah. you're doing great <laughs> so um growing up my parents we moved a lot and it wasn't because of the military it wasn't i don't know it wasn't anything like super i don't know we moved a lot my parents had the money to do it and yep. so every three years i was getting uprooted mm-hmm. and as a child all i wanted was security mm-hmm. all i wanted was like stability you know yeah. something consistent and um i became a disciple and i'm like yay it's the kingdom i finally have a family this is awesome uh and i went on a mission team and, and i was and I, I began to feel this fear this torment of god is going to send me somewhere mm-hmm. god is going to take these people away from me mm-hmm. and it broke my heart mm-hmm. When I was asked to leave New York and to go to Boston, I just wept. Thank you. I wept. I was just like, God, why? Why do you give me what I want? And then you demand it from me immediately. And then I remembered, he said, that's the cost. Mm. Just like Jesus asked uh, Peter, do you love me more than these? Mm. And so, sisters, there isn't everything that you have. And God is going to continue to ask it from you. Yeah. every year till you make it to heaven mm-hmm. and we mm-hmm. have to be willing to give it up mm-hmm. every time i wept and then then i gave my heart to boston and then they're like hey um we want you to print, plant the church in portland maine i was just like <laughs> <laughs> again <laughs> i was struggling my first i was like but what about my girls yeah. baptize all these young women at bu I don't want to leave my girls. They're like my babies. Mm-hmm. We just got a thing going, God. <laughs> Why are you calling me to leave it again? Why do you always do this to me? Mm-hmm. And I realized that this is my cross. Mm-hmm. Yeah. This is my cross. But I, and I, in, in my humanity and my sin, um, I want to cross this Christianity. Mm-hmm. It's be real. I, yeah. I want my comfort. I don't want to be called to go everywhere to do anything. I don't want to be called out of my comfort zone. I don't want to move into a smaller apartment. I don't want to have like a rinky dink car. Mm-hmm. You know, I don't want to shop at Goodwill. Um, I, I want to have the, the liberty to do all these things the way I want it. Yeah. I don't want to sacrifice. Mm-hmm. But I'm so grateful for the cross. Yeah. And when I think about the sacrifice of Christ, can't go here. Anything that God asks from me doesn't compare. And so I just want to share with you all to consider anything that God asks you to give up. It does not compare. God asks you to give up your comfort, to share your faith, to lead a Bible talk, to lead a discussion, to do a, a, what's it called, a telethon. (laughs) It doesn't compare to the cross. It just doesn't. And so a scripture that I just want to reference it's James chapter one, and it talks about how we have to consider it pure joy. Yeah. And I remember wrestling with moving to Portland. I was like, God, how on earth do you want me to continue to consider this a pure joy? Because I know this is not going to be the last time. How can I figure this out now? And so I figured it out, kind of. Um, I, I was like, okay, so James chapter one, um, Greek translation. And I looked up, what does that word consider mean in the Greek? And it means to to lead out. Mm -hmm. And so essentially what the Bible is teaching is we have to lead our thoughts out 
mm-hmm. prioritizing mm-hmm. that it is a joy when God gives us hardship. Come on. Then I said, okay, so where's the joy? Like, okay, I get it. I got to leave my thoughts, but like, I still don't get the joy part. That word joy actually translates to a grace of God. Wow. So when we try to avoid the cross that God puts in our life, when we try to run from suffering, you're actually denying yourself the grace of God. Wow. And I was like, okay, God, I was like, okay, hold on. Okay, what is the grace? <laughs> and then <laughs> this is me, this is my quiet time. Like we're wrestling, like I just want to understand. And then I, I realized, oh, Hebrews 12. It says that when we allow hardship to complete its work in us, yeah. it makes us mature, complete, and not lacking anything. Mm. So the grace of God is God. that God puts uh, crosses in our lives. He puts suffering in your God. life so that you're complete and mature and you don't lack anything. Yeah. He's such a loving father. He doesn't want you to be incomplete. Yeah. But when we run from our cross, well, then that leaves us immature, mm. incomplete. Yeah. And we're lacking. And so the grace of God is that we can be like Jesus when we carry our cross. Yeah. Another grace that I can think of um, when it comes to suffering uh, is, is just bearing fruit. Yeah. If we go to John chapter 12, Come on. John chapter 12, we'll be coming in for a landing soon. Yeah. Well, John so chapter so 12. It just, it hit me in a different way, writing this lesson in verse 24. Oh, let's start in 23, sorry. Jesus replied, the hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Uh, Very truly, I tell you, unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies... It remains only a single seed. But if it dies, it produces many seeds. And so I want you to remember this. And I want you to repeat after me. When I die, die, the gospel lives. The gospel lives. When I die, when I die, the gospel lives. Really allow that to resonate in your heart. When you die, many souls are saved. Yeah. What is the one thing that you need to die in? Mm. So those five women that are waiting for deliverance can be saved. Come on. What is it? Let's go after figuring it out, sisters. Digging into our hearts so that many can be saved. Mm. Many souls. We can reap a huge harvest. Um, I want to close in Ephesians chapter four. I really appreciate this. You know, we're talking about carrying our cross. Everyone has their own cross, right? Yeah. Like it looks different for everybody. Um, but what I love is that God's expectation is that we all carry, it, yeah. that we all carry our cross. Um, in Ephesians four fifteen through sixteen. Come on, excuse me. It says here, um, instead, speaking the truth in love, we will grow to become in every respect the mature body of him who is the head, that is Christ. From him, the whole body joined and held together by every supporting ligament grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its what? Work. 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 So carrying our cross is the avenue that God, he uses work for us to do that. He has work for us to do, sisters. Mm -hmm. We have to die so we can work so the gospel can live. And I think it's so interesting because it says here that we're joined and held together by our work. Mm -hmm. When we work together and we love each other and lost together, that's what joins us together. Mm-hmm. That's what holds us together. Mm-hmm. And it's God's plan that every individual, every woman here, you are called. Yeah. You are called to bear much fruit. Yeah. God has a plan that everyone in here yeah. bears much fruit, yeah. much fruit. And so my encouragement and challenge is 
just get in the battle. Mm-hmm. Get in the battle. It doesn't matter how the last year went, mm-hmm. how the last 10 years have gone. Okay. Like, this is a new year. Yeah. This is a new year. This is the year of the spirit. We can walk in step yeah. with the spirit. Mm-hmm. And so get in battle and build the church. Yeah. Allow God to do immeasurably more than you could ever ask or imagine. Mm-hmm. And so my, my closing statement here is very simple. <coughs> When we count the cost, when we are pierced by the cross and we carry our cross, there's nothing that Satan can do to stop the advancement of God's kingdom here in Syracuse. Thank you so much for letting me share. What an incredible workshop this has been. What an incredible day. I, you know, I gave my notebook to Val because she needed it for her lesson. So I I took my notes as best I could. (laughs) But I just, I just want to highlight a few words because I really do feel like this workshop has been spirit led from beginning to end. And and everyone's message is all tied in so well together. And it was so convicting. laughed and cried over and over again all day (laughs) today but i just appreciate so much each one of you ladies um like i was telling trisha i said i i can't remember a workshop where every single message was just super deep and and honest and convicting and uh, i'm just super grateful for each one of you in the way that you poured out poured out your hearts each one of you is such an excellent example in the areas that you spoke on, and I just am super, super grateful. But just a few words that I just want to recall for you as you review your own no- notes tonight and tomorrow. Um, submission. Mm-hmm. Surrender. Yeah. Honesty. Mm-hmm. A soft heart. Mm-hmm. Purity. sacrificial love Mm -hmm. with no boundaries brokenness a pierced heart Mm -hmm. pierced by the revelation of righteousness Mm -hmm. and I I do feel like we each have a lot of counting the costs that that we need to do Mm -hmm. I think that that is what the spirit is as moved Mm-hmm. Um, and all of these ladies to, to preach to us today is, um, you know, it's time to count the cost, whether you've just been baptized or you've been around, you know, years and years and decades. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, I feel very convicted that it's yeah. time for me to count the cost mm-hmm. uh, and really consider where I've become dull and sluggish. Mm-hmm. So I, I just really appreciate this, guys. It's just I'm, I almost just felt speechless. Like, what in the world can I can I say <laughs> after all of this? But I have a lot of reflection to do, and uh, um, and I hope that you all take it super seriously. We have an opportunity, <laughs> and uh, yeah, I'm really excited to see what what this year is going to bring through our repentance. Yeah. Um, so we'll close out with one final song oh and God. just to remind you all we'll be at the Marriott tomorrow morning yes. 10 a.m. Amen. Amen. Amen.